So building the oldest house, uh, briefly, I'll talk about who I am, uh, a world design director in Remedy Games. I actually originally started off as an architect. I trained here in a brutalist uh, architectural school in Scotland before moving into video games uh, after teaching architecture for some time. And I actually worked on Grand Theft Auto, uh, three iterations of it with Rockstar North. Before moving to Remedy, um, and I worked on American Nightmare and Art Direction on Quantum Break, and finally World Design on Control. So what is world design? Uh, what does that mean? Um, I actually consider it creating the potential space that supports game design and narrative. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's basically building what I would say kind of fertile ground because it happens so early in a, in a games project uh, that it's, it, we work in a, mid, a visual medium. Uh, so unlike world building in a more traditional literature, literature sense, it's more similar to production design in movies. And what we try to do is provide a foundation for, for the development of the game um, and provide hooks for, for game design and for the story. It's a stage for the story to take place. So today I'm going to cover three of the components that I use in world design, which is the world layout and the history and the background of the world, the technological lore, uh, and I'll go into that as to why I think this is an important part of, of world design. And finally, I can't do a talk on, on control without talking about, of course, the architecture because it's famous for its brutalist architecture. So hopefully most of you have had a chance to play control, but for those of you that haven't, um, control we released in late 2019 and we had DLCs in 2020. And it follows the story of, of Jesse Faden who enters what is known as the Federal Bureau of Control in the US. And it's a government organization that attempts to contain and comprehend the paranatural. Uh, so if you think of movies like X, uh, series like X-Files or so, um, it's almost like that taken to extremes. Um, so Jesse arrives at the headquarters looking for answers to mysterious events in her childhood. And when she arrives at the Bureau headquarters, uh, a paranatural force known as the Hiss has attacked the FBC and killed its leader. And through means, Jesse becomes a new director and then is charged with protecting the Bureau and uh, defeating the Hiss. So the game's set entirely in this headquarters building. So it's entirely set in the interior of the building and the building's known as the oldest house to the Bureau. So the oldest house, uh, a good way to actually give a background would be to show the world trailer we released before releasing the game. Uh, there's a good backstory uh, presented in the trailer, so I'll show that now. Peggy 18. August 4th, 1964. Bureau agents discover the oldest house, investigating an altered world event case in the New York City subway tunnels. It's a place of power. From the outside, it looks like an ordinary building, a brutalist skyscraper. But inside, it breaks the laws of our reality. Unstable, mad, shifting. There are rooms in the building where other dimensions leak in. We call these rooms thresholds. There is a connection between our minds and the unknown, often hostile forces intruding on our world. These forces gravitate toward everyday objects, a gun, a television, a house with a reputation of being haunted. So somehow, affect these events. We're holding the key, but we don't have a clue on how to use it. We're dealing with dangerous, unknown forces here. What's the cause and what's the effect? Are we the starting point or just a necessary evil in this? <laughs> 
We're on a mission to find answers to these questions. Or die trying. This is Zachariah Trench, the director of the Federal Bureau of Control. So the building was set in New York, and it's described as a monolithic, faceless skyscraper. And this is an early matte painting I produced to sort of represent that. And it's actually based on a real building, which is the AT&T Long Lines building um, in the center of Manhattan. And it's actually a, a it was a telephone exchange center set up. Uh, so it doesn't require windows. And it's one of those buildings that hides in plain sight. I mean, it's a lot of people haven't noticed it before, but it's there. Um, so we had this concept of, of an office building. Uh, so I arrived early on in the project uh, when it was just this initial, initial thoughts. So the first, next thing to think about world design initially was, of course, the world layout. And when I arrived on the project, I remember seeing a whiteboard where one of the designers had sketched out a cross section of, of, the, of the oldest house. And of course, they immediately started thinking about a real government bureau office building. So there was a lot of offices and accounting and uh, investigation uh, floors and uh, one research lab floor. And I remember looking at this whiteboard and the first thing I said was that all the fun stuff is going to happen in the research floor. So uh, we had to do something about that. I mean, it's, it wasn't giving enough potential space uh, to use the, the word that I like to use in world design again. It was, it was so concentrated in one area. So we, I would, thought we had to rethink how we'd approach the oldest house. So one of the things you can think about is they recover items from the real world and something known as altered world events. Then uh, they have paranatural power and they study them and bring them back to the oldest house. That was one of the premises of the game. So one of the terms I, I always had in my mind was a, as a prison for the weird. Uh, it was new, new weird genre we were, we were inside as well. So what would did that actually mean so I came up with this thing known as the, the haystack analogy. And there's a little presentation to that. So trying to find one of those objects in the real world that had caused an altered world event uh, would be like to use the English expression, finding a needle in a haystack. Um, it was timely, time consuming and, and kind of costly to do. And the Bureau wouldn't want to leave that, that thing out there in the world for too long. So instead of finding the needle, I proposed they bring the whole haystack back to the oldest house. And once they bring the whole event, and this would be similar to reconstructing uh, like a disaster or, or you know, bringing the, all the elements back and then sifting through that to find that one thing that was causing the, the altered world event. So once they bring it back, they contain it. And then once they contain it, they find the needle, they find the thing that's caused this altered world event, the paranatural forces, and they move that to research. And that helped to split the functions of the Bureau up and add more, spread more interest through the world. Another thing was, instead of thinking of the building contained by its external envelope, so instead of thinking of it as floors stacked on top of each other, um, the whole point of the oldest house was it was was the inside was different to the outside. Uh, you could think of it almost like the TARDIS in Doctor Who. Um, it didn't conform to physical laws. It was a crossroads between dimensions. So I had this concept of sectors instead of floors. So we would actually group the functions together loosely uh, and connect them together uh, without having to think of them being constrained by this exterior envelope of a tower. And uh, with the haystack analogy, we, we, it meant we had this sector called containment. Uh, and containment allowed us to create some really interesting spaces. For instance, the panopticon, which itself is based on a prison theory or based on observation, uh, which is what the Bureau does. There's a lot of, kind of observation and containment there. So the panopticon was a really good metaphor. I mean, we created one in the containment area. And also large storage. I wanted them to be able to bring the haunted house back to the oldest house. Uh, 
and then find what caused that. Um, I actually remember seeing some references in America of where they actually move whole houses on trucks. Uh, so that kind of thought of bringing large entities and possibly back to the oldest house and studying them meant we could create some really interesting spaces in the world. There was another issue we had. Uh, we were trying to create a more open world this time uh, compared to our usual linear games. We wanted to create something that was more Metroidvania, it had more freedom of choice in the world. But that brought up issues of navigation because it's an entirely internal world. So how do you navigate uh, in that space? Uh, because in a normal exterior-based open world, you have castles on hilltops or mountains or other landmarks that you can see from a distance to orientate yourself. So how would we create some strategy for orientating the player? And in games, you would tend to call this hub and spoke, but remember, I came from architecture, so I remember the nucleated village pattern, which is a, a type of uh, urban growth uh, where if you think of a village, it grows from its heart, it grows from the village square, and it grows quite organically. And uh, I had the concept of creating these village squares, these, these hubs that the player would remember and orientate themselves around. But then that would give freedom to the level designers to lay the mission spaces out in a more organic fashion. In Remedy, we work with screenplays and, uh, and our storyline is, is quite prescribed um, on the level design process. So the level designers needed freedom to be able to lay those pacing and the spaces out to match the screenplays, to match the intent behind the missions. So the next step from that was what would be known as spatial mapping. Um, again, another architectural technique, which games use as well, is to brainstorm all the spaces for each of these sectors and then generate a hierarchy and a connection between them. So the larger bubbles you see there are spaces like the Black Rock Quarry or the power plant or, or the, the executive lobby. Um, and then we sort of we we trace some of the mission paths through those in order to make sure we're using more unique spaces and spreading the player throughout the world. And of course, in the final game, you can see, I mean, it's it's game production, that's an organic process. There's a lot of iterations of things advance beyond beyond a very structured approach like that. Um, but this is where that that nucleated vision uh, the village, the uh, central space with the more organic growth out from it actually worked quite well for us because you can see clearly from these plans, we have these village squares, we have these hubs, um, and then there's much more free form uh, layout for the for the mission flows and the, for the level designers to actually actually pace their, their work. We were making a new weird to game, uh, so Another part of the world design is, is weirdness. It, uh, it was an expression that I heard in, on the design team a lot was make it weird. Um, but that was very hard to define. Um, it's like saying make something nice. It's, it's a difficult term to, to pin down. So uh, I had to kind of come up with a better direction for how, how weird would work in the world. And for me, that's contrast. Uh, something's only weird or strange when you have the mundane or you have something to refer to. So um, weirdness is, is something that feels off or different from normal. So we need normal. So we need contrast. And there's a lot of contrast in, built into the world and control. I mean, we have this concept of the Bureau and the Hiss and they represent order and the Hiss represents chaos or entropy. And also the concept of the mundane, there's a functions of a bureau and then the weird, the, the paranatural elements in the world. An early concept to kind of capture that for the team I produced was this concept of the mundane meeting the weird. You had the, the machinery of a bureau meeting this, this uh, the, the paranatural and the strange behaviours in, in the oldest house. So there's this uh, water cooler delivery person and, and this is a normal office function but the building shifts so things move around in the building and sometimes the, the functions of the bureau meet that face on. Another early concept was this of a map of the of the bureau. Uh, the concept of the oldest house as a shifting place. Uh, something Sam Lake, uh, he's a huge fan of the book uh, House of Leaves. 
and uh, that describes this, this building that she changes its dimensions internally in strange, uh, unaccountable ways. And that's something that we had in, in for the oldest house as well. So this map was a, an early concept I created just to try and try and explain how the Bureau tries to, if they can stick a label on something unexplained, it feels less intimidating or, or less scary. So uh, they would continually resurvey the oldest house and you can see all these edits and updates to the plan. And there's a little story in this, this where one survey team goes missing and another was sent after it. So this kind of really was a way to kind of establish that sense of the oldest house having its own rules. And the ultimate expression of that is the, the building shifting with this concept where the architecture itself would be shifted and corrupted by the hiss. And that's that contrast of stability versus entropy. And this is where the brutalism and the architecture of the oldest house really helped give us a strong contrast with that because brutalism has this very orthogonal solidity. Um, so this impossible coral-like growth and, and chaos and entropy of the architecture uh, gave us a really strong, uh, strong contrast there. One of the things was uh, with building shifting, initially we went, there was a thought of it being more subtle and you can see an example of that at the start of the game where the building orientates itself out of eyesight of the player. Um, and then when you come back around to the lobby again, because of the corridors have shifted, but that didn't really give us a big enough visual payoff I felt for the player. So with the concept from game direction of control points where you would regain physically control of the building, uh, gave us the opportunity to do these much larger, larger visual payoffs. And we'd leverage Houdini for this. Uh, the building, the room shells would be processed by Houdini to create these animated meshes. So another example of contrast um, in the world design is something I'll talk about pacing and impact. And this image is really to do with horror movies. In horror movies, you have the jump scare uh, or you have these moments of, of horror. And in order to give them impact, and, and meaning, uh, you need the mundane again, you need these much slower tension moments in the movie. And that's something we kind of do architecturally in, in the game as well. So for all the kind of mundane areas in the, in the building, that's these areas of low tension, the areas where, where you give the player normality and what they expect. You have the trappings of an office, you have you know, file storage, you have office desks, um, you have lobby spaces, and these are all very normal. And then what we have is what I would term architectural jump scares. We have these high point moments, uh, and that means we get much more impact and we get that weirdness. Uh, again, we need normal in order to get weird. So we have the impossibility of scale for redwood trees in the, in the research lobby or the, the power plant and maintenance, or things something where we take the roof off of the building, suddenly you're in this night, you have this night starry sky in the, uh, in the Black Rock Quarry. Uh, that was something I always wanted, is to have this moment where there would be a sky. And the last form of contrast is destruction, of course. Uh, something the game's well known for is this concept of comprehensive destruction. Uh, physicality was one of our pillars in the game. So we have telekinesis and we also have this destruction and brutalism and supports that because it has this concept of honesty of materials where, where you understand how things would break. Um, so we designed the contrast. A lot of the spaces are very clean. There's a lot of high amounts of repetition, desk spaces, you know, desk, desks repeat. Um, and that amount of repetition, that cleanliness is there because, because of the gameplay and the action and the destruction, the player creates this entropy and the player creates this, this paints chaos and, and uh, destruction across the, sort of the uh, palette of the, of the architecture. So, so we needed to try and make sure we had contrast there. So some things that the world spaces seem overly clean, but that's because of the, the destruction. So another piece of world building is, as I mentioned before, is technological lore. And this is something I've employed a lot in my world design. Um, and for instance, in Quantum Break, we, we riffed off of heavy science uh, quite heavily. 
uh, and created a lot of a lot of kind of palette and and kind of language around that. And the reason for this is because technology and culture are quite closely related. If you think about mid 20th century America, uh, you have the car culture. So the automobile, the technology of the automobile actually bled into the culture. Uh, so you had drive-in movies that affected the architecture, your drive-throughs, um, and it was glorified in, in, in the print and media. So technology can affect culture. And this is something that, that establishing a technological lore or finding that, that hook um, actually really helps inform the world design. So for control, we had this concept, uh, I came up with this concept for physicalized information. And we realized these bureaus uh, would, would cling to what works. Um, and I had this image, there's this news story I read about the US uh, nuclear launch codes um, and how that up until very recently, and in, in, in fact, in the 2000s, they were still using, uh, carrying the disc, this disc, this uh, nine inch floppy disc drive, uh, which actually contained the launch codes. Uh, and that technology dated from the 60s or 70s. So there's this reliance on existing kind of reliable technology. And uh, for control with the paranatural forces at play, we had this theory that, that uh, more kind of transient information like electronics and emails wouldn't be trusted. They could be more easily manipulated by the forces at play in the oldest house. So they would rely on physical information. And that's where the mail tubes came from. So I created early concepts of, of the mail tubes and other forms of physicalizing information like punch cards and, and, uh, and information that was kind of turned into something more physical and difficult to mutate under the influence of the paranatural forces. And of course the mail tubes then became this physicalized information. The mail room becomes a cathedral of information. Um, I had this concept of creating something that would be more like, like a forest clearing. So the, the mail tubes become almost like trees and you get this interesting kind of shadowing and, and light in, in the space. And one of the other technological features in and control is, is something known as black rock. Um, the hedron, which is this entity and, and control, which gives powers to, to fight the Hiss and fight the paranatural forces is quite recent in, in the game lore. Uh, and I wanted something that would precede that, which was some form of shielding or dampening that, that the Bureau would employ. And because of that physical pillar, uh, I wanted it to be something kind of physical and solid. So uh, this concept of black rock, this material that would help dampen and control the forces at play. And you can see it in things like the shelters, which are these panic rooms. Again, that notion of potential space, uh, for instance, with the mail tubes, uh, it was something that gameplay could use or narrative could use because it could contain information. But also these shelters are effectively like something like, like chests. They can contain something. So in the world design, even though the game design isn't, isn't there yet, the idea is in the world design to try and create these, these places that could be potentially used by game design and narrative. So Blackrock, actually, the, the interesting story there is, is that the reference actually found was magnetite and magnetite is a strange mineral um, there's more of it on the earth that can be taken account of they think it's maybe created by lightning so that there's a strange strangeness to it already but it was historically used uh, it's mag naturally magnetic and it was historically used in for divination so in the occult but it's also used in a powdered form in concrete uh, for heavy concrete which is used for radioactive shielding so this balance of science and the occult was really appealing to me and, it, and it, it was an interesting kind of story for this mineral. So we adopted it for black rock in the game. And also you can see the black pyramid form in its crystalline shape, which was interesting. And you can see black rock used in the, the fire breaks. Fire breaks originally, I, I had the idea of using them as a navigation device uh, as these impossible voids they ran through the building almost like canals in a city. And they would be uh, they would be literal fire breaks that would block paranatural forces between sectors. They didn't really kind of get used entirely for that in the end game, but what we actually used them for more is, is, uh, is kind of tonal 
steps down on the in order to build for drama for instance where you go to the the, the uh, panopticon again it's those architectural jump scares this is one of these moments that we try to kind of try to kind of emotionally press the player before we kind of move into one of the kind of more dramatic uh, sectors or to prepare the player for the next part of gameplay and of course the black rock had to come from somewhere and uh, we, i thought about using a threshold which is one of these dimensions that bleeds into the oldest house so uh, again, I really have wanted to create some place where we could create this surprise for the player where we would suddenly take the roof off this interior world. So uh, I wanted to create this starry sky um, for the Black Rock Quarry, where the Black Rock came from. Um, and a huge shout out to the concept artist that had to hand paint those stars in order to get them punching enough in the sky dome. So that's some of the world building elements. Um, the last one is the architecture. We really need to cover the architecture for control because that's one of the defining elements visually in, in the art direction. And the architectural style we'd settled on was brutalism. And this actually, the concept of brutalism came from our game director, uh, Mikhail Kazarin, and he uh, suggested this style initially. Um, and it's, it's, it was a great choice because it's something you, you're seeing a trend for as well. There was a lot more Instagram and 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 people were actually taking more of an interest in brutalism. So it felt very kind of on, on tone uh, culturally with, with the awareness of it these days. So very quick primer. Um, brutalism originally came from an ar architect, one of the most famous architects in the 20th century, Le Corbusier. Um, he didn't actually start brutalism, but he coined this term beton brut, which was to do with this unexposed expression of raw concrete. And uh, that architectural approach was ad adapted and used in social housing and became this brutalist style. Uh, Alison and Peter Smithson uh, were the architects in the UK that, that really kind of pushed it in the UK. And of course, we see it in, in Eastern Europe as well. I mean, it spread really far in Europe as a form of social housing. Um, in the US, it wasn't so much used as housing. It, it was adopted into institutions like universities. This is the Andrews building in actually in Canada uh, and it's used as a lot of movie sets, most recently in Shape of Water, the uh, Guillermo del Toro movie. And then Boston City Hall, which was another big, these two were big references for us. Uh, Boston City Hall, so government buildings started to adopt brutalism. And of course, Washington DC has the FBI building and there's, there's a lot there. So it made sense for for the Federal Bureau of Control to use brutalism too. So it felt very on, on tone. And uh, of course, recently brutalism has had this more dystopian, um, dystopian uh, attachment, things like Robocop and there's uh, Clockwork Orange in the 1970s. It's Stanley Kubrick is a director that uses a lot of reference. He'll come up again in the talk. Uh, Stanley Kubrick uh, used it in Clockwork Orange to represent this sort of dystopian government uh, in the movie. And of course, Shape of Water, they used the Andrews Building for the Government uh, Research Institute. So for the arc, for the to train the environment artists in architecture, I created this very simple guide called Be Brutal. Um, and I had six overriding principles uh, and basically with art guides, I feel that art Bibles, I'm not a big fan of. I, I believe that, that artists don't read a lot of documentation. Uh, they tend, so actually the best thing to do is to create, create a, a guide that's a very simple toolkit and to trust the artists and to guide the artists and, and actually kind of learning that toolkit. So this is more about principles of how we create these spaces. And then a lot of sketching at the artist's desk and, and talking them through the architecture. So the first principle, I won't go through them all, but I'll go through the main principles here, was mass. And this is the idea of expression of heavy and pressing mass and forms and low and wide openings under tall surfaces. So we create very kind of low wide openings in order to accentuate that sense of mass pressing down. The first space I designed in the game actually was, was the boardroom. Um, and for the boardroom, I saw it as this place of power, this place for focus and decision making it was the it was the court for the director to rule over um, so 
above the table, I created this very solid light box of concrete. So that this pressing mass um, that really kind of accentuates that idea of decision making and focus and pressure. And in actual fact, another another influence again, Stanley Kubrick again here was the War Room from Doctor Strangelove, and this is one of the most famous sets and movies um, it, it comes up again and again and it's designed by a production designer very famous uh, Sir Ken Adam he's known for a lot of the James Bond movies as well and he was architecturally trained to a lot of production designers and movies incidentally do come from architecture so the final end game version um, it uses these pressed panels on the side so that it has this feeling of a wood lined boardroom it's very traditional executive tone but expressed in concrete so it retains that sort of brutalist um, feeling another ex L example the second space probably I designed was the lobby uh, for the executive and uh, it has a huge expression of mass there it has this black pyramid that that sits over the seal of the of the bureau interestingly the black pyramid eventually became the board in the astral plane um, so there's an, almost a symbolism there of the board uh, sitting over the over the, the bureau, the seal of the bureau. But in actual fact, the Black Pyramid came from our art director, uh, Yanni Polkinen, had a symbol very early on in production of this inverted triangle for control. And uh, you can see it later on in the logo, this kind of, uh, the, the kind of repeated triangle design. And it became a black inverted triangle. So really this lobby design was was me expressing that, that, that logo is this pyramid. I didn't even refer to IMP's uh, Louvre building, which is an obvious reference, but uh, that actually didn't come from that. Um, and uh, you can see in the game, the first time you see this space, it's actually the lighting reduces it back to that, that graphic design. And then at some point during production, it became the board in the astral plane Another sort of sign of mass, expression of mass, is the slot, the, the building entrance. Remember, it's a faceless concrete block. The entrance to the building is just a slot. Uh, it's, it's, but it, it uses a lot of government um, sort of tropes, uh, government building tropes. It's an empty space that you don't really want to be within. Um, so it has this concept of hiding in plain sight. So, uh, so it's a weird building. You, people don't enter it. Uh, but it has this kind of intimidation factor to it, so, so people would walk right past it anyway. This is a, the first concept I did of that space, uh, which just really kind of captures that, that federal bureau kind of feeling, but, but uh, people are walking past, no one really seems to notice it. And that that is really influenced, uh, there's a photographer, Paul Virilio, produced a book in the, the 1970s about bunker archaeology. Um, and that prison for the weird vibe, you can actually see bunkers actually are one of these architectural influences there as well. That this idea of solidity and this, this very kind of simple slot opening. Structure was another thing that brutalism gave us and, and use of cantilevers and kind of these kind of open openness of structure and honesty of structure, something that you see in brutalism. Early concept was this idea of taking that, that repetition, this almost ritualistic approach to the structure. And the open structure actually plays in, gives us a really good advantage on game design. Um, the player can levitate in the game. So the player, the play space is volume, not just plane. Um, a lot of games, it's the, the play space is just, just the plane. Uh, so you've got more freedom to do something artistically with the rest of the space. With this, uh, because the player levitated, the brutalism actually kind of helped us a lot because of the structural, the use of structure and brutalism. It meant there's less columns and the, because of that, it means that things like balcony open openings or uh, the corners are open, which means they're more accessible for the player since the player can effectively fly. Um, and it increases the sight lines, so it makes combat much, much more, much easier. The sight lines are clearer. So, uh, so brutalism really kind of helps support the, the idea of gameplay as a volume. Another thing is modularity. Uh, the brutal, the uh, Boston City Hall here. I noticed this double waffle ceiling. Uh, waffle ceilings are a kind of feature of brutalism. I noticed that, that it was retooled in many different ways uh, in the reference photographs. 
uh, with different lighting strategies and it was used differently for lobbies, for corridors or for offices or for other public spaces. So I created a, a little kind of sketch model here uh, with a bunch of different approaches. This, this is how we can use this modularity to actually create uh, in, different, in different ways with different lighting strategies. And uh, our game world is built on a four meter grid. So, so there's a lot of heavy use of modularity in the game. Um, not just in the ceilings, but also we created a Lego block kit of, of uh, for the world, so that there's a kind of hybrid approach to the levels that we used used the modules to block out the world very quickly. But then some of those spaces, because they're so highly architectural, they're um, they're they're uh, building shells. So there's a hybrid between shells and modularity in the world. But remember that the gameplay is a volume um, ethos in the, in, the, in the spaces. One place we, we did have more artistic freedom was the ceilings. So you see there's a lot of architectural playground in the ceilings um, from, from things like the, uh, the trees in the, in the, uh, the mail room uh, to, to uh, the use of a circular, um, a circular motif in the, the research areas. So you'll notice in the ceilings that they tend to be distinctive in terms of there's a little bit of character for each of the sectors, but also give us more, more room to play with lighting and, and the kind of uh, environmental design in the ceiling spaces. Which brings me to surface. Um, brutalism is known for concrete. But the thing is that they actually play a lot with textures and, con and concrete. So it's not just concrete, um, it's, it has the structural honesty. So you see the boarding, the, the molding on, on them, you see them chiseled, you see the different roughnesses and smoothnesses. So the idea was to actually push more of a palette with that one material. And uh, in the game, uh, our environment artists created quite a large library of concrete in, in the world so that um, each sector had a slightly different area of the game, had a slightly different material and even though it doesn't it seems very subtle it's something the player would would subconsciously pick up on but of course it wasn't just concrete uh, this is an architect uh, called Louis Kahn and uh, he created this is a, a Yale uh, Centre for British Art and also the Phillips Exeter Academy Library and uh, one of the sectors the executive sector I wanted to retain that executive feel and, and, and play off of these kind of visual stereotypes of, of boardrooms and, and corridors of power. So uh, these references incorporated this wood panelling with the concrete and that was a really kind of powerful kind of reference for me for, for creating that palette for the executive sector in, in, in the uh, building. And this is the first concept where, where I kind of brought that together. So you have the wood panelling and you have the concrete. Um, there's a couple of other things that these brass uh, details on the panelling. They are inspired by an architect called Carlo Scarpa. And he, he's known as a master of detail. And his influence is actually somewhere else I've gone to next. Um, so the brass detailing and the red carpet give this idea of ceremony and ritual because of the sense of the occult in the world. Articulation, uh, another subcategory of surface was the idea that, that um, our artists shouldn't think of things as flat. They need to actually put some movement in the surface. So you can see where the beams are and you can see how the, the, the world kind of moves, the surface moves and it helps with the play of light because we're using kind of quite advanced lighting techniques. So that kind of helped with the, the use of one material, then you need to do something more with the surfacing. And that brings me to this kind of idea of the terror of the empty surface. Um, traditionally in video games, we would create a lot of decals and, and cables and, and put a lot of noise on the surfaces. And a lot of that comes from lighting technology. Lighting technology is a lot better now. So there was a continual kind of challenge with the artists to try and pull them back and restrain them from, from doing that. Uh, there's like a, it's almost like the kind of fear of open water for artists. Um, so the thing is early on in production, the lighting pass hadn't been put in. So it was a struggle for them, but, but they managed to, show restraint and that's how the architecture comes through much better with the lighting. 
And you can equate that to architecture again. If you look at Baroque architecture, it was this kind of concept of more is more. And if you look traditionally, when normal mapping came out in video games, things like Gears of War had this very Baroque style and it was very heavily detailed. But I feel that we're at a point now with ray tracing, real-time ray tracing and more uh, better GI solutions that we've got this architectural opportunity now. Uh, Tadeo Ando on the right, has, he's known as a master of light in architecture. And he has these very unadorned surfaces because you can put so much uh, artistry and movement on the surfaces just using light alone. In fact, light is a big element of our game. Uh, you can see it. Uh, our art director was in, worked with the lighting artists here, so it's more his story to tell. Um, but the, the lighting and the use of red as a supernatural uh, kind of shorthand was, was really powerful. Uh, one thing I would say is that we used architectural lighting because of GI and surf being able to light surfaces instead of actually having that idea of that spotty kind of a uh, spotlight kind of lighting you see in a lot of games. We could actually integrate the lighting more into the architecture. So you can see we use a lot of light panels and, and kind of uh, more architectural lighting with the light is integrated into the room. And another reason for that is the use of skylighting. It's an interior world which would get quite psychologically oppressive. So we use skylighting a lot to get that sense of the open world, to get the sense of there was another world outside um, the building. And, and it helps to give this, this psychological relief for the, the player. So the last thing is um, in the architecture is something that steps away slightly from brutalism, but we're the game deals with the occult and paranatural, so we have this concept of ritual and ritualized space, and that's achieved through repetition and symmetry. So for repetition, um, we looked at repeating architectural elements, and in particular, in particular, uh, back to the architect, Carlos Scarpa again. Um, he was a concrete architect, not necessarily a brutalist architect, but I remember from architectural studies that he was known for this stepping and this stepping had this, this way steps would turn up walls and, and it was a kind of really strange geometric um, and design that he had in, in his architecture. So we decided to kind of adopt that uh, idea of, of repetition. And also uh, with bunker architecture, you have this concept of embrasures. So there's a kind of similar kind of bunker-esque feel to that as well. In the first space that we used that, obviously, it's more ceremonial spaces like the, the executive um, hub. And you can see in the approach to the boardroom, remember I said the boardroom is the court for the director. It's one of the most, the seat of power, the most ceremonial space almost in the, in the game. Um, you have this use of repetition and the stairs turning onto these kind of um, decorative half columns. Um, and you can see that embrasure like bunker kind of approach into the, into the doorway. So we use stepping as a motif, architectural motif through the, throughout the game. And symmetry, uh, there's a lot of use of symmetry in the game. And that's in part inspired again by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, he used symmetry, the one point perspective, a lot in, in films such as The Shining, and especially The Shining because he uses it for creating this unsettling supernatural atmosphere. So there's something of a homage to, to Stanley Kubrick in, in this work. And you can see us using the, the single point perspective in a number of places in the game. And the game's titles control it. And the interesting thing about these single point perspectives is they're normally in like a corridor. We need to control the player. So it is actually about control when we create these, these single point perspectives as we're trying to draw and control the movement of the player. And you can see that in the furnace room, this is um, the guideline here was I wanted to create something like a Mayan temple. It was an approach. And in fact, there's a side mission in the game where you actually do sacrifice things to the furnace. Uh, at one point early on in the game design, we even had a furnace keeper who was a bit like Ahti, the, the janitor. Uh, he was a mysterious character, a uh, masked character who would, who would stay there and he actually kept the furnace. And of course, the director's boardroom. This is my first concept of the board, oh, sorry, boardroom, the director's office. 
And uh, the idea is a single point perspective, this this uh, approach to the desk. I mean, it's, he's the most powerful person in, in the bureau, so he, they had this this very kind of ceremonial approach to him. Interestingly, at one point, I actually thought to have the only window in the oldest house here, so the director would be reminded that what was at stake, so should things escape the oldest house, uh, he could see the outside world. Later on, we removed that, and it was better, I think, and cleaner to keep everything somewhere in the oldest house you don't see the outside world uh, and also the uh, the maze from shinings actually on the carpet pattern here and mazes actually as another form of control there's a motif there in the in the game some carpet patterns look like mazes and of course the hotline chamber um, there's a red line that you follow to the hotline chamber and that that was something I wanted to lead into a maze so that the carpet pattern in the hotline chamber is, is basically a red thread that leads to this maze-like pattern. Again, it's another, another symbol for control. So um, I think we're almost out of time. I can't believe I managed to keep that to 45 minutes. Um, conclusion. So if you remember when I started the first slide was what is world design and i think there's an easier way to summarize that to me world design is cohesion um if you when up when the game was launched and we looked at a lot of reviews uh, that was a word that kind of to me that struck struck out that that i saw a lot in the reviews was this word cohesion and i think that's where what good world design can really help a game is that idea to create this cohesive quality to the game. Again, remember I talked about potential space. So there's that idea of supporting story and game design and, and to help provide that fertile ground. Um, and it helps provide a glue between between all disciplines. That's why it's a difficult job because you have to have you have to have that sympathetic approach towards game design and narrative and architecture, art, art direction. Um, it's, it's a tricky balancing act. And it's something that coming from architecture, uh, an architect has to do the same. I mean, you have to have construction, you have to have all, all the technicalities to a building, but it has to look beautiful and people have to be able to use it, it has to be functional. So there's level design there as well. So it, it's, a, it's something that I feel that, that I was kind of trained, trained for was well design. Cohesion is, is is really kind of where we can add the most most to a game's uh, qualities. That's it. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, your speech is one of one of my favorites today. I'm personally really really amazed. So, thank you very much. Um, thank you. We have a lot of uh, control fans uh, listening to us today. So here are, there are the questions. So Andrew asks, uh, he says uh, that he really likes control, but could you tell um, why is it so difficult to navigate on game map? Why didn't you use a more user-friendly way or is it, uh, was it intended? I think, it's, I think it was what was intended. Um, is that the concept of the, the world actually has navigation built into it with the signage and that, was, that came from art direction and, and from game design. Um, the map was a very hard thing to produce uh, because of the way the world world is. I mean, it moves and shifts as well. Um, the thing is, with it being Metroidvania, we wanted to encourage exploration too. And, and the problem is that if you have a mini map, I remember I came from GTA, so I, I have that background in open world games. If you have a mini map, people play the mini map. They don't pay as much attention to the world. And you can see that problem with games like Assassin's Creed. Um, and if you do a golden path uh, approach, then the player follows, follows a golden path approach. So if you're building a Metroidvania in order to, in order to have the player explore, you kind of have to accept there's going to be some friction to navigation uh, built into that, that kind of approach. So, uh, so having the kind of separate map was, was was the kind of uh, only way we could we could encourage the exploration, I guess. I uh, hope that answers the question. Um, thank you. Um, our next question is: uh, Were the levels bid with Jesse's skills in mind? Uh, yes, to some extent. Um, we had the concept of the 
comprehensive destruction. So there was always ammo for, for telekinesis. So, uh, so being a modular, the modularity, the game was built with modularity in mind so that we could consistently use Houdini and use the tools in order to create that, that level of this layer of destruction that always existed everywhere for her. But also that, that sense of scale and, and volume uh, because there's levitation. The game was definitely designed for that because uh, because we had to create that more large architectural volumes in order to allow the player space to, to use a levitation. 